I'm Maria Shumkalian, the Vice Chair of Pennsylvania Film Industry Association, and we're very lucky today we have a very special guest, Patrick Markey, who is an executive producer of a fantastic show, Ozark, that many of us love. And Patrick has been working on it for four years. And also Patrick worked on the first season of Servant here in Pennsylvania. And we were lucky to have Patrick here. And now we get a chance to ask Patrick some filmmaking questions and get some practical advice from breaking into this competitive industry. So Patrick, the first question is, how did you get started in this difficult industry to break into? It was a weird uh, start and uh, not traditional at all. Um, I was in graduate school at Ohio State, working on a master's degree in theater, which is what I really wanted to do. wasn't a film person, but I mean, I go to movies, but I didn't have a particular affinity for film. And uh, while I was there in graduate school, I was tending bar to pay my way through school. And there were some people that came into this bar where I work that worked for the state of Ohio's Office of Economic Development or Opportunity, whatever you call that. And they had just gotten in touch, somebody had gotten in touch with them from 20th Century Fox. They were coming to Columbus to shoot a feature that Fox was doing with Robert Redford. They said, you should go to work on this thing. You know that, I said, I don't know anything about movies. My background is, is in theater and that's what I do. I said, no, no, you'll be fine, you'll be fine. So anyway, long story short, they convinced me to meet with these guys. I met with the producer. They hired me as a local guy, PA, and the first job I and actually they offered to pay me the same amount of money I was making as a bartender. Three hundred dollars a week, I think, is what I was making. And they said we can match that. We pay that salary. That's fine. Why don't you come work with us? I said why not? I did. And the first job that they gave me was to find a house for Bob Redford to live in while he was there. A very specific needs as far as security and what the amenities and where he wanted to be located. So I took that job with the first, this first job, first assignment being this house. Found him a great house, worked out really well, went on to become a PA on that show and went to locations, did all kinds of stuff. Became friends with Bob Redford at that point and he hired me from there to go do Ordinary People with him, which was his first directing assignment, which won the Academy Award, a couple of them. Big deal for me, I had no idea, but um, I went to Chicago and spent about six months working on that show with him, which went on to be a big hit, and then kind of stumbled my way into the business, you know, that way. Eventually moved to LA, started getting PA work, whatever I could do, and sort of worked myself up. I never. Uh, started at the top by any stretch. I worked my way up from being a PA, location manager, production manager, producer, executive producer, kind of each time improving my skill set to where I could uh, better myself in the business and learn the craft. But I learned it all on set. I didn't learn anything in uh, film school. Mm -hmm. What are the differences in the duties of producer and unit production manager? never been able to really delineate that. Um, I've always been interested in the creative side of filmmaking because that's what I, I'm more about what I studied when I was in the theater was performance script, staging, the dramatic presentation of well-written stuff. So in my interest in the film business, I had a tendency to migrate towards those things, although I didn't have any of the connections you would get to get hired at that creative level but I kind of taught myself that. And one of the ways to get there was to become a production manager, taught myself the budget, schedule, do all that kind of mechanical stuff that is very important to a movie and helps you learn how to hire people and that sort of thing. That's the production manager's job. And then a line producer, which is what I went on to do after that, is sort of a more def defined version of a production. A lot of production managers go on to become line producers. Mm -hmm. And that job is kind of more of a, think of uh, the production manager as more focusing on the below the line elements of a film for the most part. That's where the production manager hires the crew and pays everybody and rents the equipment and does all that monstrously difficult stuff and they do it so well. They did a lot, they do a lot better than I ever did it. Line producer is kind of between that production thing and the creative. You sort of ride the line between those two. And I did that for a number of years and then eventually have been hired on as an executive producer and uh, the, all that comes with that, which is more on the creative side, but still paying very close attention to all the production elements. Okay. 
how can a producer uh, do so well that he or she is remembered? And who is in charge of hiring that producer? Um, I think the best way, <laughs> my colleagues might disagree. I think the best way to be remembered is by putting great stuff on the screen and making it a rational, reasonable process to do that. Don't make it too painstaking or uh, it's not worth bringing you back around again, but working really hard to get the best stuff on screen that you can every single day, being mindful of the budget, uh, uh, sort of those more practical limitations, and then always realizing that you have to make it as good as you possibly can make it, or it doesn't matter. And I think people that do that consistently and are decent to work with and are honest and all that sort of stuff, that's a given. Um, the work is there. There's plenty of work out there. Mm -hmm. Okay. And who is hiring the producers? Um, on a show like this, it's the studio, and that would be MRC in this case. Mm -hmm. People did House of Cards mm -hmm. and a number of other shows. They produce it for Netflix. So they are the ones that approach me or my agent or someone like that and start to put together um, a list of people. And then a number of meetings or uh, encounters with people like Jason Bateman, who is one of the principals on this from the beginning, and Chris Mundy, um, and meeting with me, talking with me, meeting other people and deciding who's the best fit for the show. But the job is hired by the studio, but then they defer to what the principals on the show, the, the kind of movers and shakers on the show, what uh, opinions they have. So they don't say, this is your person. There's two or three people that we really like. Meet them and see what you think. That's usually how that process goes. Mm -hmm. And for aspiring producers, uh, and I, I heard there's no aspiring producer if you're a producer, you're a producer, but the ones who haven't done something big like this yet, what are some steps to getting hired by the studio for something? I'm still an aspiring producer, so whoever's telling you that you don't continue to aspire is wrong. Every time I go out, I try to find the best material and the best people. So it's a job that uh, you should never stop doing, I think, even if you've done well continue to look for good work and pick material that you're passionate about mm -hmm. and that you can make a difference with. And from that, other jobs will come. Don't look at the money. Don't let that lead. Let your making a living part of it. Let that follow rather than lead. And I think you'll be fine. And pick, it's fine. I've done movies for less than a million dollars. I mean, work at all, up, up to a hundred million dollars. Mm -hmm. And these series are very expensive as well, but it's not really the budget. It's about the material and the people that you get to work with. And so find something you care about. And if it's a hundred thousand dollar film that you can make a difference on, go do it rather than a hundred million dollar film in a studio that maybe you're not interested in, but makes you can make a lot of money. Do something you're passionate about. That's nice. You can't go wrong. That's very inspiring. Uh, should producers concentrate on one genre? or it doesn't really matter for a producer uh, which genre he is. You mean as far as the material? Mm -hmm. Yeah, is there a difference? I, yeah. I've taken very few jobs in my career because I really want to make a living here. I've taken them as much as I possibly could based on material. Mm -hmm. And material matters a lot to me. And uh, there's a lot of jobs to be had out there, but there are very few jobs that have fantastic writing associated with them, good talent. Occasionally you have to go take those jobs to make a living or fill in. But I think sticking with the genre, unless you have a particular, some people would do these huge special effects shows, action things, which I've never done. Um, I suppose, I think it's probably better to focus on what you like more than what pays the most. Do something, take a show, that makes you want to jump out of bed at four o'clock in the morning and say, let's go do this difficult as it is, allow that to fulfill you. And if you can do that with whatever the genre is and you feel that passion for the job and that sense of commitment and that desire to make it as good as it can possibly be, knowing that sometimes it's going to fail, do the material that means the most to you. And then when you have to push that rock up the hill, which can be very difficult some days, you're doing it for something that you feel is worthwhile and it's a story in there to tell. So I'm always driven by the writing and by story more than I am a genre. And are there any other characteristics of a project that 
producer should uh, consider when selecting a project to work on besides loving the script and the story? Oh yeah, it's got to be the right team of people. I mean, the, the culture has to fit and um, some people get along with each other better than others do. And so I try to find out who the people are that are doing it, kind of what their background is, what brought them to the business, how they relate to people. It has to be good material. And I think it's even more important to be, <coughs> I always tell kids, film students and stuff, when I talk to them, choose the best material you can find, but also find the best people to work with. So it's a combination of both of those things. The best material with the people that are a bunch of jerks, not worth the time. It's just too difficult to go through all that drama. And if they're a great bunch of people and the material isn't worth anything, that's the same kind of failing. So it's got to be really, really great people and really good material. Nice. Thank you. Makes sense? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, you get to spend a lot of time with these people for, for, for a while. Completely. I'm your family for a year or better in most cases, certainly in the feature world. I and mean, then this is, we're going on four years with the same group of people. And you develop this familial relationship with people where they are part of your family and everybody needs to succeed. Or if any of us fail, we all fail kind of thing. I think it's really important that we support one another and back each other up and admit that errors can happen and forget them and move on. Pay really close attention to doing the best work every day. And you kind of curate that group of people uh, to come on the show to fit into that aesthetic or whatever it is you're trying to make work there. But it's got to be this sense of mutual respect and everybody feeling passionate about what they're doing and being very considerate of one another. Mm -hmm. How do you select episode directors and why can there be a consistent director on TV shows? You see on TV shows always there's a I asked that question when I first got in this because I came out of feature for years, one director, one vision. Um, quickly finding out that in TV mm -hmm. and in the streaming world, it's really the executive producer showrunner that has the vision for the show and has the consistency with it. Directors come in, they're marvelously talented, they show us new stuff all the time and help us put it together. But it's not a director-driven medium, although there's some fantastic directors in it that have a lot of renown and they deserve it. It's, it's a producer-driven, or executive producer, showrunner-driven medium. And so we bring in directors, we do a lot of research, we watch everybody else's work, we find out who's doing what, who's doing something good. And then we try to put together a group, especially early in the first season, you try to find new directors for every episode or maybe every two episodes, so that you have a sense of how a director will put that up on its feet. We're reading the script, we're talking about it, we have real strong um, connections to the material, but we haven't visualized it. And sometimes a director can take you on that visual journey that you might have not thought about or missed. So you bring in a number of people over your first couple of seasons. And from them, you start to pick and pull and say, this tells a story. And then you go back to some of those directors. A lot of times people aren't available the second year. And but now I'm finding as we go into our fourth year here, we're developing some three episode blocks, a lot of two episode blocks, fewer directors with a more precise um, vision of what Ozark is or what Ozark needs to be, but that doesn't mean that those new people coming in can't still bring something that we haven't seen before. So it's a way of finding, it's a way of finding the show is by going through those directors. And then at a certain point, we sell and say, okay, this is kind of where we are. These people do a great job. Let's bring that person. So we start looking for who's available, but mm -hmm. finding good directors is difficult. They're all very much in demand now. Mm -hmm. So it's the showrunner who makes the decision on those directors? Um, I'm usually involved in that process with Chris Mundy and Jason Bateman. And then we talk with the studio, obviously, they got a lot of ideas, MRC, and then um, Netflix as well. They all weigh in with director ideas. And sort of a group, that group of us, maybe a few more people in the group, but that group of us usually make that decision. What makes a TV show script promising, the pilot version? What makes it look um, For me, and this is probably, everybody in Hollywood would have a different description of that, but for me, it's based on the writing, and it's based on the characters, and the characters' relationships. And I, uh, I use that term familial when I was talking about the crew. I also feel in stories, 
And most of the things that I've done that I've really been proud of and that I've enjoyed the most are stories that are deeply embedded in one way or another in a familial structure. Families, broken families, dysfunctional families, difficult families, all the stuff that we know in our lives and people that we know, but it's based on that, the familial tug, you feel that sense of family. When you see Marty and Wendy, uh, the, the birds that star in the Ozark, you see them struggling and having difficulty and they end up in this wacky money laundering cartel scheme, living in the, in the hills of, 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 uh, of Missouri rather than the plush suburb of Chicago where they came from. They just get kind of wrapped up in their world. Marty got in over his head. The whole family has to go there. They're completely fish out of water. That's not their people. They're trying to figure it out. And even though they can be kind of gnarly characters from time to time, you still care about them and you care about their kids and you care about the Langmore family and their relationships. And there's something in those familial relationships that are universal. We all relate to that. Even if it's not exactly how we live, we see elements of people in those characters that we take back and say, Oh, I got a cousin. I know some that sort of thing. And people come away from your show. People don't watch it to see money laundering. Jesus, we've seen that a thousand times on television, heroin trade cartels, whatever the case may be, those stories are good and they're entertaining, but that's been done. This is about a family in crisis, a family struggling, trying to keep it together, fumbling badly, and sometimes doing some fairly disreputable stuff, but they're trying, and in that try, there's a certain admiration for them. And I've found in the films that I've done, where that is the strongest, that familial thing, as disruptive and screwed up as it might be, those are the ones that resonate most to me, and those are the ones that go on to uh, touch people. And I, I did a River Runs Through a number of years ago, which is about a family in crisis, difficulty. Everybody knows that Brad Pitt character is probably not going to make it, but he's this charming, good looking kind of Greek god of a guy living this idyllic life in 1920s Montana, fly fishing and doing all this kind of stuff. But there's something doomed about him. We watched that show because it is about this. Scottish Presbyterian family, 1920s Montana. They happen to fly fish to kind of hold themselves together and make a bond. But it's not a movie about fly fishing. People say, oh my God, that fly fishing movie. 12 minutes of fly fishing in that entire movie. It's about a family struggling. Fly fishing holds them together. It's a beautiful metaphor. It was really beautifully written by Norm McLean, reflecting on his own life in Montana. He was a big fly fisherman. It sets, it sets the world, but it's not a movie about fly fishing. It's a movie about people. And that's same thing with Ozark. It's about families struggling, families in crisis. Yeah, it's a relatable, relatable script. Yes. Perfect. And not always in the best way. It's like, oh, what's going on there? You know, it's not like it's, it's not like a Hallmark card. Mm -hmm. You can have all the rough edges around it and all the acrimony and the difficulty tied up in it as it should. But it's about people that you have an interest in because you're, you can relate to some parts of it. Uh, every set has its own personality. So how do you ensure on set that positive, enthusiastic atmosphere, despite all the challenges that happen, time limitations, budget limitations, everything stressful that happens I, along the line? A lot of that yourself. Mm -hmm. And you, you know, you kind of collaborate with the key people. Mm -hmm. um, I remember when I first started working on Ozark and I got I know Chris Mundy, who's a showrunner, writer, and fantastic guy. Jason Bateman, who is our star, but also director, producer. And the three of us met. We all have backgrounds. We've all been doing this a while. And we just decided that these, they're not any jerks a lot. If anybody comes on that way or if somebody has a reputation of being that, go do another show, not this one. And we have held to that and created a wonderful atmosphere. It's one of the most popular shows in Atlanta to work on because of that spirit. And we continually create that and if people act otherwise or are nasty or difficult then we move on from there so it's about curating the right group of people to work on the project and people respect and that's not to say you can't have differences we do all the time and you can't have you know kind of arguments and it can even get contentious but it can't be nasty it can't it doesn't work and so we have eliminated it as best possible and I think it's up to us when we're choosing a project to choose ones to work on where we feel that kind of energetic sense for lack of a better term. Yeah. 
what are some ways for a producer to be effective at crisis management? At crisis management? You know, that's kind of what we do. We've been in crisis management since I got in this business. And everything seems like a crisis and it seems like the end of the world. And oh my God, what's going to happen? And you know something? Most of the time it comes out okay. So you stop panicking and you start developing an acute sense of how to make that decision. So often those, those decisions get conflated with ego and all kinds of power and want to show somebody who's boss. Those are the wrong decisions to make. But crisis management is what we get paid to do. I mean, if everybody could jump in here and do this, it would not be the job that it is. We are paid for that perception, that intuition, that sense of how to manage this group of 100 plus, sometimes 200 people, all working on the same thing and all having slightly different ideas about what that thing is based on their question, production designer, set decorator, cameraman, they all have, oh, this is really important, that's the most important. Well, it is important, but somebody has to look at the relative importance of all of them. Mm -hmm. And that becomes sort of the producerial perspective. And uh, I sometimes use the analogy of the blind man and the elephant. Did you ever hear that parable when you were a kid? Mm -hmm. You know that story? This is, I think it was set in India, and these were, these were like uh, wise men. Uh, they were like monks or whatever, some kind of holy people. And they lived way in the middle of nowhere. And they were all blind. And they all had certain senses or skills. And I think there were eight of them or something, as I recall. I should go back and read this story. I quote it all the time, and I haven't read it in 100 years. Um, they're, they're approached with an elephant. There's an elephant there. And somebody said, here. And these guys start experiencing the elephant. One guy touches the leg and said, oh, it must be a tree. It's falling there. Another one touches the tail and said, oh, it must be a snake. Another one touches the trunk and that's like a, I don't know what, each of them have a different metaphor for what they're touching on the elephant. None of them are right because they're only seeing a part of it. They can't see it all because they're blind. A movie is the elephant. And these people think it's the trunk or they think it's the snake. They think it's whatever that other metaphorical piece is because they're only looking at it kind of myopically, like you want somebody to do that's a designer or a cameraman to look at how it's going to shoot. But somebody got to step back and say, wait a second, guys, we're still looking at an elephant here. We're not, we're not, re you know, you know, somebody has to have that perspective. And unfortunately, not for, or fortunately, that becomes part of the producerial job is to step back and say, okay, we're about to spend a whole bunch of money. And what are we doing here relative to this thing we're trying to create at the end of the day? And maybe that's not the best place to do it. But you have to do that with tact and diplomacy. And you have to engage. If you hire people, you need to respect them. And if they say that they think this is the best way, you need to give them their time to show that to you and to spell that out. And you can still say, no, we're not going to go that way. We're going to go this way. But it's a judgment call about how this needs to get done, knowing at the end of the day, we have to have this completed. It has to be as good as it can be to send off to LA to get cut together. And somebody has to make those decisions. And we do it all the time. And that's part of the reason that we get paid for what we do. And crisis is something that we're very capable of dealing with. And we've had you know, terrible accidents and all kinds of weather and just the worst things that can happen. We've all been involved in that. But none of us, none of us have ever seen anything like COVID. And our business changed dramatically on the March 17th or whatever day it was when we shut down on Servant. Everything going forward is completely different. In COVID, we don't know anything about. We're learning every day. We have COVID experts on our show helping us get through it. I spent the last 10 weeks prepping on Servant initially, and then uh, Ozark are kind of both together up until just turning Servant over to some other folks recently. And in those 10 weeks, I have talked a little else. I'm usually reading the scripts and doing all kinds of creative stuff, getting the directors hired. None of that has been going on for the last 10 weeks. It's all been about COVID all the time. And I'm anxious to get on to what I know. I don't know COVID. I do know movie making, but our COVID people are getting up to speed. They're terrific at what they do. We're working with them, but that's a crisis that none of us have ever faced. And it's a crisis that's extremely serious because you make a movie and there's a crisis and oh my God, we're gonna have to shoot another day. Or that film yesterday wasn't worth a damn. We're gonna have to redo that. Or some decisions like that it doesn't it's not as good as you want it to be it costs more than you want it to cost almost never do we have to deal with the consequence of some 
somebody dying or somebody getting ill with something like COVID that you can't even detect where it is. And the technology is still learning all that stuff. That's almost an existential problem and crisis that we don't know how to solve. And usually by having done this for so many years, you think, ah, I can probably figure that out. Yeah, it's a real difficult thing. We're going on the water with all the boats and the people and the blow explosives. But you know something, we can figure that out. We'll break it down in pieces. COVID doesn't offer that. And that's really concerning for me. It's also extremely humbling that we're now stepping off the edge to do this with this disease lurking wherever it is. And we're also shooting in Atlanta. We all know Georgia has a high incidence, but when I was in Philadelphia, there was a big incidence of it up there too. It's a huge concern for everybody. And all of our business, our film business, our movie business, everybody's concentrating on COVID right now and trying to figure out how to work, do good work, despite that. And that's a crisis of monumental proportions compared to the, all the dramatic stuff that we think is a crisis every day. I understand that right now it's it's difficult and confusing and nobody knows anything but is there anything that you have uh, maybe encountered or learned while dealing with COVID to help with producing maybe some guidance oh my god so much as I say I've been doing this on zoom calls and yeah. meetings and intensely with the studio and hundreds of people working behind the scenes with all of our COVID experts and consultants and people in the studio and the network um, yeah, we've learned a lot about how to, all of our sets are really going to be regulated, who can be in what zones, who, we're testing some people three times a week, some people twice, and some people one time a week. Everybody drives onto the lot, they come through a little tent, they get tested, they get their temperature checked, they have to fill out an overnight medical thing, how are you feeling, any kind of symptoms. Mm -hmm. It's unbelievable, and we have learned a ton about pandemic, COVID, transmission of diseases. We have to revolutionize the way we feed a crew, just put people can wash their hands and all that stuff that you never even think about. It's like, okay, that's yeah, but it's all up the grass right now. So yeah. And I don't even know what I've learned. Some days at the end of the day, I think I've learned nothing, but I'm sure at the end of this, it's like, Oh my God, we have really been through it. Yeah. I mean, after, after that, I think it's going to be so easy producing and everything else is going to seem like a piece of It seemed easy. It always seemed hard. No, I'm so tired. Oh my God, that's so frustrating. And why isn't this better? Now it's like, what are we complaining about? Jesus, those were days were com very <laughs> easy compared to what we're faced with now. But we'll get through it. And I do think that there's a big opportunity for all of us to learn, to be humbled once again by the fact that something like this simple virus that came from somewhere has taken out 200,000 people in this country and made millions sick and over, uh, I think it's in India right now, 100,000 people a day, if I'm not mistaken, are being diagnosed as positive. Just imagine in those impoverished countries, at least we have some ability to fight it here, although we have some idiotic leadership at the national level, we have some good medical care. Also, those, under, those countries that aren't so fortunate feel so badly for that because it's just, there's, it's, it's really scary. Yeah, it is, but like you said, hopefully soon enough we'll pass this. Yeah. And we come out the other end and we all learn something and yes. take care of each other in this process. Um, I think it's good even though some days you just wish it would go away. Of course. What about some common challenges that happen quite often on sets that aspiring producers can prepare for? Um, trying to think, you mean like scheduling conflicts and difficulty with? I mean, I mean time is definitely a very common challenge, uh, trying to fit uh, the vision into the time provided. So sure that is, but yeah, it's always a, it's always a, an eth exercise in value you want to end up with the amount of time you can spend on it. And then, okay, we're moving on to the next thing. That's as much time as we have for this. When is it good enough? to walk away from that happens all the time and we could always use more time we could always use more money and a long time ago someone told me that movies are never really finished you just have to walk away at a certain point because you can take it around with them forever in post-production and add stuff and make things different at a certain point you're out of money you're out of time or you're just like get this thing out of my way you're done with it but they never are finished and so there's this sense that we could do better we could do more mm -hmm. and we deal with that all the time. As you do this longer, you start to realize about how to schedule, how to make those 
scenes that are more relevant or more important dramatically, how to put those into a part of the day that makes them land better than trying to do them at the end of the day or trying to make it all those little, and there's thousands of those tricks, follow me around, I'll show them to you, um, about how to improve the process. And every time we do one of these, and this is, I've been doing it a long, long time, that I didn't know before. And yet each time I take a job, I'm pretty confident, oh yeah, I can do that, I know that stuff, I've been doing this a long time. And then it's like, holy shit, I never knew we were gonna have to deal with that. And then you learn that and think, okay, but at the, at the end of a movie, if you went back and examined all the difficulties you face on every given day and you make a thousand decisions in a day and you had to face all those at the same time, you would say, there's no way I can do this. I can't be ready. But you take that confidence, and once again, humility, very important part of it, and come at it and say, I think I can probably figure this out as it comes up. But if you look at that whole myriad of problems that you will have solved by the time you're done, you'd be debilitated. You'd never be able to do it. So it's just an accumulated knowledge, a sense of confidence, a sense of also failure, knowing that this stuff can fail at any given moment. And you just go forward. And if you have good material and good people, and a reasonable amount of money and some luck from the gods, you're gonna probably do okay with it. And then if you get really lucky and everything works and you get 18 Emmy nominations, then it's like, oh my God, that is the best. But we don't do this for nominations or for prizes or Academy Awards, although they're nice when they come by. You do it because you really love the work. Nice, that's nice. What are some things that you've learned that could be done differently to, to save some money on set? Maybe uh, something, uh, maybe some unnecessary expenditures or better financial decisions that producers can consider. In the well, we all make decisions based on what information we have at the time. And then you always learn stuff in hindsight and say, oh my God, we could have done a lot better there. Or why did we end up doing that? And sometimes you get in a little deeper on things or you build some huge set because you think it's going to be important and you use it three times over a run of three years you spend all that money those are all decisions that in hindsight you might do differently or taking a show in a certain direction and then finding out no it should be going this way the story's not working you need to bring it over to here we deal with that all the time I mean, those are just that's part of the process and you try to look ahead and see the value of each thing you're spending because if you don't if you spend it on this, you don't have it to spend over here, and this over here might be much more important. So we're always constantly balancing that, trying to figure out what's the best decision in this set of circumstances. We're always looking for ways to do it as efficiently as possible and as cost effectively as possible. And as you get more experience and you know how to hire right, because I hire great people and they do their jobs so well that all that money saving that we could do better over here, they bring all that to us and then we get to make decisions based on it. But uh, it's not like a light bulb goes off and say, oh my God, we should just do this. Those decisions are not always perfect, mm -hmm. but you gotta make them and you gotta move forward and then you can correct some of that imperfection in the process. If you stop it and say, I don't know, we gotta wait and then stop everything just to make that decision, you're done. You have to keep it going. You have to make a decision with the best information you have at that time. And then you refine that as it continues to move and you change direction with it. You alter it to be a better decision than it was initially. But if you don't make it because you're paralyzed with fear or something, the process shuts down and you're dead. So it's about making decisions with humility, but confidence and a sense that we probably can figure out a way to make this work. We don't know what that answer is right now, but we will learn that in the process as we go, if we get rid of our ego and we approach that with a sense of letting that information come to us rather than forcing a decision. Uh, for the relation, oh no, actually you brought up, <laughs> it's a lot of thoughts that are running through my head. I'll add this part. You can follow the thread here. You can, uh, do like a stream of consciousness interview. Because I have a thread, but I also hear you say something. I'm like, oh, that's a good question. So it pops up. But then I'll edit that embarrassing thing. Also, that happens in the movie business a lot too, where we start one way. Yeah. And then something happens on set with an actor or with a director or whatever. And it's like this genius moment. And rather than say, no, no, stay with the script. We're doing it. Like, Whoa, let's look over here right now. Because 
that story starts to tell you what it needs, just like an interview would. And you have all those questions, I'm gonna ask this guy and he knows what he's doing, maybe, maybe not, but I'm gonna ask him all these questions. And then something comes up that interests you as a person, you take that where you think it should go because that's where the opportunity lies in this world, not the book learning or the, 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 the education we have or the structure, we've got to do it this way because why? Then you see something and say, oh my God, we would have missed that if we weren't paying. So go with that. Thank you for comparing this to a genius moment. I appreciate it. <laughs> no, I'm serious. Any work can be that, whether it's you're a builder or you're doing something, you know, you're a mechanic and you find some new way to put that engine together or build that building and you learn something where it's no, no, it says in the book you should do it this way. That's where invention comes from. Yeah, absolutely. So you've mentioned uh, when you were when you're speaking about when is it enough? So how do you deal with that cognitive dissonance when you feel like you can always do better and the scene can constantly be improved, but you have to stop somewhere? <laughs> that's uh, that's the, uh, the conundrum of any kind of uh, creative endeavor, I think, is to I have friends that are fine arts painters and they paint these fabulous paintings and at a certain point, okay, I'm done with that. I could all, they're never done. And I think in a way, knowing that that gnawing desire to make it even better never gets put out. You never say, ah, oh, fuck it, that's good enough, we can do it. No, you don't ever stop, you, you keep going. And then at a certain point, you've got to look at all those other parameters, how much time do we have, how tired is the crew, how the actors lining up, how's the story working, answer all those questions and make a decision. Okay, we're done for today. We're going to move on. Mm -hmm. And then say, God, why did I ever do that? I've done <laughs> a few times in my life. I've done that career where I just made a stand because we were absolutely in trouble. And I think there's only one really glaring example that I still remember like it happened yesterday and wished I would have made the other decision because it would have cost more money, but it would have been better for everybody and everything, and especially the cameraman that was involved in that discussion with me. To this day, I still feel badly that I said, no, we're done, we gotta move on, and uh, pulled him out of a shot that he really wanted to get in a certain way. Yeah. Okay, it's, it's a tough one. I, I think it's a tough one. Does that one. make sense? It does make sense, it does. It just, it's very challenging mentally and emotionally when you know that so much depends from that one scene, and especially when, Usually you can't be in the editing room for too long. You have a limited time in that editing room. So it's, it's hard, especially like the editing room decisions. I heard producers also have just, you know, a few days in that editing room and then you're done and you have to let go. So how, how do you handle that too? Like when there's so many cuts and they're all great, how is that decision made? Yeah, and you want to make the right decision and sometimes you don't. The case I was referring to, A River Runs Through, did you ever see that movie? I haven't, but I'm, it's on my list. Brad Pitt stars in it. It's about fly fishing. There's a lot of fly fishing in it in Montana, period stuff. Mm -hmm. We're out in the middle of the river. The Brad Pitt character is standing on a rock in the middle of the river. And he's doing this particular maneuver with a fly rod that nobody else can do with a line going farther than called shadow casting. I think it's what it's referred to in the film. It's a signature shot in the movie. It became the poster for the movie. I knew it was important because the father and the other brother who know this guy's doom are standing on the shore watching him execute this particular thing with a fly rod that nobody else can do. And they're saying something to the effect of, oh my God, there's nobody on this earth that can do something like that. He is of another world because of his skill that's shown at that moment. And it's a big wide shot on the Gallatin River in Montana. He's out on this rock. It's bright sun. It's like 12 noon and the sun is right down on top. It's the worst sun for a DP. They want it backlit, they want it frontlit, they want it side lit. they do not want that. And it was hot light. And Philippe Rousselot, this wonderful French cameraman that won an Academy Award for that film, um, said, Patrick, we have to do this at the evening. I said, Philippe, we can't, we're dead. We had no money on that show. We lost our funding, put together some money in Europe uh, with a wonderful guy named Jake Eberts who came up with money at the last minute. And we had no money to spend on that film. The entire thing was done for less than $10 million and um, went on to get all kinds of acclaim. Uh, but I said to Fleet, no, we have to shoot it now. And he said, oh, please, he was like, like this, almost tears in his eyes, asking, and he's the sweetest, nicest, and most talented guy ever. I said, no, Fleet, I'm sorry, we have to go now and get it. 
And he went ahead and shot it. He was very cool about it. He didn't get nasty. He just got his heart broken. He didn't get nasty at all. And we shot it, and it was in hot light, and it was okay, but it wasn't what it could have been. And he knew how important that was, even more than I did. I mean, he could tell with his work as a DP and kind of breaking the script down for shots, and it became the poster, all these things that made that so important. And I just said, nope, we have to shoot it now because I had this enormous pressure on us running out of money in Montana with the entire crew. I don't know if I'm going to be able to pay him the next week. I said, no, let's just go ahead and do it. And we did. And I've never forgotten that moment. It was a wrong decision. I should have said, I don't give a shit. If we have to stay here all night to get this, this shot is so worth it. And if, if I would have been maybe a little more experienced, a little more confident, and um, not been looking at the bottom line, and at that point, I thought the plug would be pulled and we'd be done. That's why every time I made that decision, I was wrong. And I, it was one of the things in this business I regret more than anything else was not letting him, who, letting Philippe, who was right, have what he wanted at that moment. And he was only asking for it. It was absolutely the right thing to have in the movie. And we didn't have it in the film, although it still looks great. That particular shot, every time I see it, I kind of wince. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for sharing this. I'm, I'm sure of course. it's kind of... Mistakes is something you learn from and improve as you as you go along the journey. <laughs> yeah, and at the time I thought I was making the right decision for all the reasons we have talked about. Of course. I was forgetting the creative part of that and concentrating too much on the money part of that. Yeah, yeah that, that's the that's the tough fine line to you know when okay. practicing it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, care to share a, a few more lessons or maybe mistakes or experiences? that you've learned along the way that you can now say, don't do this or do that. <laughs> <laughs> I did another movie called The Joy Luck Club. Uh -huh. and it's about um, four Chinese women living in San Francisco in their 20s, early 30s maybe, and their mothers who have come over from China. And the, the girls have been raised in San Francisco, but the mothers are all from the old country. It's mm -hmm. a fabulous book by Amy Tan. And it's, once again, it's a familial thing. It's all these interlocking relationships and these crazy acrimonious relationships with mothers of one generation and mothers of another country raising daughters in a new country and the girls are modern and young and the mothers holding on to the tradition. So it was a great story. And that's one, again, that had no money. Yeah. And I did it because I loved the material so much and went on to become a very big success. But that film was a struggle all the way through because nobody really cared at the funding level that it was this dynamic story of these Asian women, which I love that story. There just was a sense of get it done, whatever it costs. It was sort of a, almost felt like it was a favor to someone that they were making it. It wasn't something that they were passionate about. We were, and the director was fantastic. So was the cast, everybody on it. Um, and we're going to China. We shot most of it in San Francisco. And then we're going to go to China for about, I was over there for about six weeks, and I think we shot over there for about four. Taking a company on very little money over there. And this was China before China opened up. Uh, it was not uh, it, what it is today. This is 25 years ago. Just starting to make a move to more Western economy and everything. Very, very primitive, but wonderful. I mean, I, love, I learned so much in China about what we do and why we do it. And you go over with all these Western notions. Well, I know how to do this, and I know how to put 3,000 extras together for this big war scene and all that. We can do all this stuff. I got to China and met my compatriots there. And then also people from the mainland. I brought people from Hong Kong and then people from the mainland. And we started going around visiting the Chinese uh, studios that were there primarily as propaganda studios. Uh, Russia had come over and trained a lot of them to make Chinese government propaganda films. Mm -hmm. Fantastic filmmakers and these really old studios and lights are all from the 50s and all this stuff that we aren't used to working with and it's something in the modern world. And I met all these filmmakers and they were great. And some of them have been doing it forever. And yet their methods were like 30 or 40 years behind what we were doing in the U.S. because they just had not embraced or had not had they had been exposed. So China was just starting to open up. <clears throat> and I had all these kind of, here's how we're going to do it. In fact, we're going to make this work. I had to just step back, take all those Western notions about what I know, set them at the door, and just listen to people and let them show me how we do that in a country like that that is very different than ours. But they knew how to make movies. And I was astonished almost every day with what they came up with 
to substitute for what we were trying to do because they didn't have the access to the technology or the money or whatever. And it was fantastic to stuff each other. And one of the best experiences, if not the best in my entire career was shooting in China in this culture where there's 30 people from the U.S. and I brought some people from Canada and then a few from uh, Hong Kong, but the rest mainly Chinese. We traveled all over the country, shot in four different main locations, and I had the best time ever. And I did not know a damn thing about what I was doing over there, although I thought I did going in. And they showed me every time. It was like, and I was at with translators. It was just this confusing mess, and I was panicking. And I thought, what am I panicking for? Just use this as an opportunity to learn. And once again, put that ego aside. And it starts to show you. And it was a wonderful experience for me and all the American filmmakers I took over there who were very um, uh, suspect of, oh my God, we're going to China. <laughs> and this is another sort of anecdotal story that probably kill me to tell it. Um, makeup and hair. I wanted to take all the principals doing makeup and hair who were Hollywood people, very talented. And they were working with these Asian, uh, the Chinese mothers and Chinese daughters very connected to their vanity scheme, makeup and hair, especially because they all had stuff to do with them. And they were really committed to one act. So I would take them in a second. So I'm bringing makeup and hair, wardrobe, uh, half a dozen departments over. But I remember every time I come back, I made like four trips to China on my own while we were shooting in San Francisco, I get back to the set. I said, what's it like over there? What looks it like? And I said, well, you know, the hotels are okay and people got around. Transportation's a little, you know, sporadic, but we can figure that out. And, and they, the, the, the women in a, in a makeup and hair department kept saying, what's it like? What's... And then finally got to the point, they wanted to know when they were on set, what the bathroom facilities would be like, like a honey wagon or something we're used to seeing. Because it was, especially in uh, um, less developed areas of China, very primitive. And public bathrooms and stuff were kind of a disaster. They didn't really have honey wagons like we have on there. Mm-hmm. So they kept asking. And finally I got down to it and said, what's the deal guys, this is gonna be really cool. I was trying to get them all excited about what we're gonna do. And they came down and they asked specifically about restroom facilities. And I said, I'm not sure we talked about it, but it wasn't. So so I went to REI in San Francisco and I bought these portable toilets or johns, like they're in a little shelter, you use them when you go camping, right? And I bought, I think four of those, brought them back to the set and said, guys, I know this is a concern for you. And I certainly, I grew up with a bunch of sisters, so I can totally understand what they were saying. And I said, these will work. And so they were so happy that I'd just gone out and spent, you know, $500 on these portable toilets that they could take with them, we would bring with us. So they knew that that part of it was covered. They went over there and they still talk to me this day about what a fantastic experience they had in China. And that one little thing was tripping them up. I figured that's easy to solve. And that once he did that, it kind of the floodgates came open and they could, there was not, a, they were so thrilled to be there and everything that they learned. So, and those women in the makeup and hair department from San Francisco, from LA, are still to this day friends with the women that they taught how to do Western makeup and hair on that show. We brought on people from the local culture, local filmmaking culture, and they still are in touch with them. So those stories are what makes it worthwhile. Indeed, I mean, such a, such a small, act that can make so much difference in how the film a lot of times is that you look for the big stuff look for the small stuff because that really is what makes a difference yeah absolutely it's it's true i mean even just a friendly attitude from one of the lead actors towards everybody can just make a world of difference it's true completely you go in that makeup tent or whatever we didn't have a trailer and we'd have the four or five people from hollywood and then maybe another five or six local makeup and hair people from Beijing or Guilin or Shanghai, wherever we were shooting. And when you first introduce them, there's a little of this. And then 10 minutes later, everybody's laughing in there. They don't speak the same language at all. Maybe we have one translator that wanders through there, but they're just having such a good time as friends and colleagues and teaching out of this cultural exchange that was going on. And it was everywhere. When we ate these little bento box lunches on set, they'd bring out this rice and some vegetables and stuff. Fantastic. Everything was different and everything couldn't have been better. I had such a good time. That's amazing. That I'm watching it this weekend. That, that's fantastic. Yeah, watch. Well, I think you'd like that, especially in women, their mothers, they, over the years have come up to me and said, oh my God, Jordan Love Club was such a wonderful movie. My mom and I watched that 
from, from New Jersey or whatever, not, nothing to do with Asian culture, and said, we, afterwards, we talked for a half hour, and we haven't talked that long since I was in high school or something like that. That kind of, those are the stories, and those are those kind of emotional touches that people hold from something that you've done that you can really be proud of, and that is the biggest gift that we get, not the awards, not the money or anything else, but to have touched someone's life in some small way and they see themselves or the people around them in a, in a more, a better way, or they're better at it for having seen whatever it is you produce. Those moments are worth everything. Absolutely. And the whole citizen of the world philosophy that you yes. put here. That's and to be in China 25 years ago when it was just starting to westernize, it's so modern now, I don't think I'd even recognize it, but it was still old China. And yet there was some modernity coming in because we were in Shanghai and Beijing, which are pretty big sophisticated cities. Guilin down in the south, very primitive rural culture, close to Vietnam. It was just like traveling around America and going to different cultural places and seeing the difference and appreciating it's very different. And yet we are so much alike, all of us on the planet. Absolutely. Thank you. That's a powerful message that is definitely worth it to share through film and can actually change the world <laughs> a lot. <laughs> You're probably not going to hear that in the class at NYU Film School, but uh, it's worth talking about. Yeah, yeah, that's important. That's what it's about. Thank you. Is there anyone that you would like to nominate to also be our presenter who you believe could share a lot of knowledge and expertise to? Is oh, sure. Um, there's, a, there's a producer named Mike Polair, P-O-L-A-I-R-E, great guy, uh, from San Francisco, produced out of LA forever. He's doing Yellowstone right now, which is okay. a big popular show. He also lives in Montana, been a friend forever, very knowledgeable production guy and has had a very successful career, came out of the business. His dad was a big producer. So he's a guy that could tell you a lot of things about the business and probably a little more succinctly and uh, more, um, not traditional, but anyway, Mike has a lot of knowledge and I would recommend it. What, are there people in certain positions that you like to talk to about what they do to introduce them to the world? I mean, are, yeah, we like, we like to speak to people from different fields of the industry, to directors, to actors, to producers. Uh, I would love to bring soon hair and makeup as well and stunt directors because everybody has different paths. So it's, it's, I can introduce you to all those people and I'd be happy to oh, share with I, you, I, uh, thank you. Um, people that, um, <laughs> talking of, uh, Joy Luck Club, which is a long time. There's an art, the makeup artist who I love in LA named Valley, B A L L I O'Reilly, O R E I L L Y. Mm -hmm. Anyway, Valley's been doing this a long time. She went to China with us. She's one of those ones that had that experience I was telling you about. She'll talk about a whole lot of other things because she's done the biggest stars and does huge movies all the time. But she's a fantastic and she could kind of connect the dots for you on the, uh, the Joy Luck Club going from comfortable San Francisco over to China and then dealing with all that. And, and she also could talk about a lot of stuff inside the trailer that I know nothing about that might help anybody that's aspiring in the vanities. And then I could introduce you to, if you go through the crew list of anything I've done, you pull it up on IMDb and there's somebody on there say, could you put me in touch with, or we'd like to talk to a, you know, somebody in post-production or somebody in, uh, special effects or whatever those areas are, I'll find you the best people to talk to about whatever you're looking to do. So why don't you just have one of your people pull all my IMDB base, look at the crews I've worked with and see if there are people on those crews that would fill a gap you're looking for. Because I could recommend a hundred people to you. I'm just trying to figure out who would be the best for feeling what you're trying to do. Thank you. I really appreciate it. I, I'm honored that you'll be able to refer them to us. It's, it's fantastic. I feel and like you know, transportation people, location people, construction, all the different crafts that go on here, craft service, mm -hmm. catering, they're all people that if you're going to do this, you should know who they are and what they do. And each of those jobs are incredibly important when you're doing them. I mean, when they're getting done, you need to get the best people in all those areas. And I know so many good people, and I'd be happy to uh, put them on to talk with you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. I, I absolutely agree with you. It doesn't matter which position you're looking to partake in. You have to understand how everybody works in order to respect. Completely. Mm -hmm. And I learned it all on set. I did not come with the knowledge. As I said, I was a theater major, 
looking to go to New York and direct and produce the theater and got into film business. I didn't know anything. But I did learn, because back in those days, when you were early on a film, you'd ride around in a van with the production designer, the writer usually, the director, um, cameraman, really keep other producers, writer, really keep people, five, six, seven of them. And sometimes you'd be three weeks on the road, you know, you'd fly someplace, you gotta get a plane, fly someplace else. So you were staying in the same hotels, you're eating meals together, and I learned the film business, riding around in bands, listening to them talk about their areas, and then <clears throat> going on and saying, this won't work because of this. I learned it that way. And I, then when I got on set, I hung out with the grips, the electrics, special effects, all those different departments. I'd spend a day or two with them while I was working as a UPM or something else. I'd go work on that truck just for a day and learn equipment and know what they do. So when they ask me for something, I don't have to make it up or have to just say no because I don't understand. I can, and I've continued to learn, and I have a great curiosity about a lot of stuff, and every day I'm asking questions and still learning stuff, so I think that's, it was a great knowledge, I know mean, a lot of people come out of film school that know a ton more about how to do this than I do, but uh, I learned on the run, and um, it's, yeah, it's, it's a great way to learn. Yeah, thank you. Besides learning a lot from you today, it was such pleasure talking to you, and your, your, your path is truly inspiring, and well, thank you. Uh, yeah, how you started at the beginning and went all the way up, knowing every part of the production. It, it's wonderful. And I hope that our viewers learned a lot and we wish you all best of luck. And we hope to see your amazing films on big screen one day. So thank you very much, Patrick, for all this fantastic and valuable. Thank, thank you, Maria. Very nice talking with you. And uh, anything I can do to help David and Ken and you guys up there trying to make the Philadelphia thing happen. I had a wonderful experience with Knight and... Uh, his company up there and I look forward to coming back to Philadelphia or Pennsylvania someplace and working as soon as something ends up that way. So hopefully I'll get to meet you one of these days. Thank you. It will be my pleasure to meet you. It's my honor and we hope that you're going to be back soon. Thank you. Okay. And you get a hold of, uh, you take a look at those credits and look at directors, writers, anybody I've worked with and I can make the introduction. Thank you. I appreciate it. I really do.